I am always hot. Well, that's what Brooke tells me. But I mean, I'm always... I don't know why somebody gave a ha-ha. I mean, it's true. But, I, but I'm, al- I'm always burning up. I'm just, it, it doesn't matter how, how cold. I'm, I'm always hot. Brooke will be under three blankets, and I'm like, I, I don't, I'm good. Bill Bush told me, you know, that's just because I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, just, I have such a warm heart that it just radiates throughout me, so I'm always hot. Those are Bill's words. I just agree with them. So I, I am, I'm, always, I'm always hot until Thursday night. When it was negative nine degrees outside, not wind chill, but legitimately negative nine degrees. And so I had a fire going inside my house, and it was glorious. Now, normally when a fire is going, it's miserable because I'm, I'm hot, and, and, but no. It was absolutely amazing when I had the fire going. I was comfortable. It brought about warmth. It brought about comfort. It was absolutely phenomenal. It was great. It was, it was awesome. And then I was scrolling around and, and reading different things. And I started reading some different news articles. And then it just so happened that I started reading a news article about the Australian wildfires. And they've killed, they've destroyed over 27 million acres burnt just this year in the Australian wildfires. So the very same thing that I was enjoying and was bringing me a lot of comfort had just previously destroyed 27 million acres. The difference is it was contained. And when fire is contained and when it's constrained, it's fantastic. It can bring about warmth. It, can, it helps in food preparation, keeps us all from dying. It's a wonderful thing. But when fire goes and it's not contained, it's destructive. The same is true about sexuality, and that's what we're going to be talking about today as we continue our look at the book of 1 Corinthians. And if you're just joining us, thanks for being here. The book of 1 Corinthians was a letter written by a former pastor, a guy named Paul, to a church that he, that he pastored, and he was no longer the pastor there. And so he sent a letter to, to the church, which was in the town of Corinth. So that's where we get the name of 1 Corinthians. And you can follow along with us in your Bible apps on your phones or your tablets, and that's a free download in any app store. And if you're not really technologically savvy, then and you don't have a Bible, we'd love nothing more than to give you one. As, as you leave, just let somebody, either with a name tag or let me know, and that's our gift to you, totally free. But we believe the best way to understand, to understand our Creator, God, is to encounter the heart of God, and that's revealed for us in Scripture. And so whether it's on your phone or your tablet in the Bible app or whether you don't do technology and, and it's, it's just a paper Bible, either way, we want you to encounter it and we want you to engage with it. So anything we can do to help you do that, it is our joy and our privilege to do so. The church that was in the town of Corinth, they got some things wrong. And we've been talking for a few weeks about all the things they got wrong, but they also had some questions. And that's where we start this morning in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1. You can follow along on your phones or in your tablets, and if not, on the screens there where we read these words. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Now I know I just lost half of you, but focus, all right? It's not what you think, all right? I know some of you have just sworn off ever encountering Scripture again. You're like, nope, I'm out. I'm out. Listen, this isn't a deal breaker, all right? Understand what he's talking about here. Don't freak out. He's talking about being single. He's talking about being single. Now, what we see is that questions about sex and sexuality are nothing new. 1 Corinthians was written a couple thousand years ago. And people then had questions about sex and sexuality. And people today have questions about sex and sexuality. And so he's addressing their questions. And the very first thing that they wrote about was questions regarding their sex lives. So when he says it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, you don't need to freak out about that. What he's talking about is being single. Now, historically, some in the church have felt like if they see somebody who's single, they need to take it upon themselves to act like they're a producer for the show Bachelor, where they're just sitting there and they're just lining up. 10 or 15 people that they know, and they're like, oh, well, this person's single, and what about this person? What about that person? Oh, this would be a great match. 
No, no, it, it wouldn't be. And I, I got married when I was 27 years old. So this happened to me a little bit when, when I was out of college and I was single and I grew up in the Midwest. Many of you did. And so, you know, if you grow up and you're not married by the end of college, and this is changing some as millennials are waiting a lot longer to get married. But when, when I was done with college, people were like, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you married? You should date this person. You should date that person. You would be a great match with this person. I'm like, thank you, Satan. But no, like I would be miserable. Thanks. Keep it to yourself. We're good. We're good. So, but but just, just stop. Just stop that. I, I know, and hopefully, we hope that you are happily married. We hope if you're married that you're happily married. And we're going to be talking about that later today. We, we hope that you are happily married, but just understand that not everybody needs to be married. Not everybody wants to be married. And just because you're happy in a certain way doesn't mean that everybody else needs to be that way in order to be happy. And so stop just stop having a pity party for somebody because they're single. And think, oh, woe is, woe is them. It must really be lonely. It must really suck for them to not have anybody to share life with. Just, just stop that. It's perfectly fine to be single. In fact, what we're going to see in a little bit is there are actually some advantages to it. But he continues in verse 2 when he writes this. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband, for the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement, for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control." All right, well, let's break this down because there's a whole lot. He says, there's nothing wrong with being single. It's great to be single. But for the vast majority of us, God has designed us and he's wired us with a sex drive. And that's a gift from God. Our sexual desires are a gift from God. That's not something that we have to be embarrassed about. It's not something that we have to be ashamed of. The fact that we're sexual beings, that's how God designed us. And he says, because of that temptation, because of your desire. So what we see right off the bat here, from even the wording that he used in 1 Corinthians 7, 1, to the, to the wording that's continued through these next verses, we see this, that God's design for sex is to be within marriage. God's design for sex is to be within the confines of marriage. That's the first concept that we see. The second concept that we see is this, this concept of rights, that sexual activity with your spouse within marriage is a right. It's not a privilege. And that means this isn't a privilege or a bargaining tool like, hey, if you do the dishes four nights this week, maybe there will be a little something coming your way. No, 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 no. That's not, right? That's not, that's not what Scripture says. It's not. It's not what Scripture says. What Scripture says is that this is, this is within marriage, this is the right to one another. This is the right to one another. That you are to enjoy each other and you are to be having an active sex life. That is what Scripture presents for us. Now, I know that this concept can be incredibly hard, incredibly hard, especially for people who've been victimized, for people who've been abused. And you hear these words, and they trigger. They trigger things. When you read words like, your body does not belong to you, but it belongs to somebody else, you flash back to somebody who violated you. And you flash back to somebody who, who took advantage of you, to somebody who, who didn't operate under the umbrella of love, which is God's design, but rather operated according to their own selfishness and their own desires and the scars that that has left. And this isn't to minimize that. It's not to, it's not to say, well, that that's magically going to go away. In fact, I, I recommend, if, if that's in your background and you've never dealt with it, that getting some counseling and talking through that with a trained professional, somebody who can walk through that with you, would be highly beneficial. It would be highly beneficial. Because the scars and the wounds of that run deeper oftentimes than we ever imagine. And so this isn't, this isn't to say that 
you have now to, if you get married, you have to just allow yourself to be the victim of abuse. You have to just give yourself away that you no longer have a say or anything along those lines. No, this is never designed. God's design for sex and marriage and love is never to be one of selfishness. It's never to be one where somebody takes advantage of somebody else. In fact, we're told repeatedly through Scripture, the model of love in marriage is to be selfless service, that we are to elevate the needs and desires of our spouse over and above our own. So that is the full context of this. But understand, but understand that God's design for sex is that within, within the marriage partnership, that sex is to be abundant and it's to be enjoyable. It's to be frequent. It's not to be the exception, it is to be the rule. Let me read these verses again. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband, that sex is private, it's between two people who are married, this is God's design, that sex is private and it's personal, between two people who are married, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, not as a bargaining chip, not as a tool, but this is, this is his duty and his obligation, and likewise the wife to her husband, for the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer But then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Meaning, if there is a period of your life where sexual intimacy is not taking place, it's because it's been agreed upon. That both both parties within the marriage are on the same page. And it's for a certain purpose. That you are focusing on something and you are so overcome with it that you're devoting that time and that energy instead of in sex, but you are devoting that time and that energy in intimacy where you are praying about it together and taking that concern to God. And here's the reality. In your marriage... Sex will either be your security or your separation. In your marriage, sex will either be your security or your separation. Never have I had to walk through the heartbreaking process of walking people through a divorce with a couple who had a satisfying sex life. Never. Not once. I've had to walk through that process with people who had everything together financially. I've had to walk through that process with people who had everything together on pretty much every other front. But never have I ever had to take that heartbreaking journey with another couple who had a satisfying sex life. God's design for intimacy will either be your security or your separation. It is a gift that God has given us. It is to be enjoyed, but there are parameters, and it must be constrained. Then he goes on for people who are in a different lot in life in verse 6, and he says this. Now, as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. He says, it's easier life being single. It is an easier life being single. But it's not for everyone. But it's not for everyone. I got married when I was 27. I had so much more freedom and flexibility before I got married. And then you add kids to the equation. It's like, you are a prisoner now, buddy. But I, before, I got, before I got married, I had so much freedom. I remember there would be nights where literally on 15-minute whim, four of us who were all single would get together. We would drive two hours over to Pittsburgh watch a baseball game, hit up some other places in Pittsburgh, and then drive back. Literally, we put this together in 15 minutes. 
We all got married. It takes 15 months for us to even return texts to one another, let alone schedule another trip together. It's just the reality. There's so much more freedom and flexibility when you're single. And some of you have found that, and you're like, peace out. I'm good. I love my flexibility. I love what I'm able to do. It's an easier life being single, but it's not for everyone. But it's not for everyone. Again, he talks about, but if you have these passions, it's better for you to marry than to be overcome and to become a prisoner to your passions. Again, embrace the fact, embrace the fact that sexual desire is part of your design by God. This isn't an, this isn't an outlier. It isn't something dirty. It isn't something that has to be secretive. It's a way that God has wired all of us that he's given us sexual desires. It's according to his design. It's according to his plan. And and the, the less that we embrace the fact that God wired us and designed us this way, and the more we try to push them down, the, just the more problems we're going to encounter and we're going to face. So embrace the fact that God has designed us the way that he has. Then he continues in verse 10. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. So here what we see is God's design for marriage is that it's permanent. God's design for marriage is that it's permanent, that marriages stay together. To the married, I give this charge, not I but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. Stay together but he knows that there are going to be problems. And he knows that there are going to be issues that people face. And he knows that this is God's plan and God's design and God's desire for us, but he knows that not everybody's going to live up to that. So then he gives us some more qualifiers here. Again, God's design for marriage is that it is permanent and that it is personal. And so he says, stay together, but but if the wife does leave, She should remain unmarried or else go and be reconciled to the person she made a vow to spend the rest of her life with. And the husband should not divorce his wife. Does this mean that God wants us to be stuck in horrible situations? No, just the opposite. But God knows that there is always a heartache with divorce. The process is always heart-wrenching and that there is always hurt compounded upon hurt compounded upon hurt. And God's desire is that nobody would have to endure that and nobody would have to go through with that. And then he continues, To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? There's a lot to unpack there. Now, Jesus has said in Matthew 5, That divorce is permissible, not mandatory, but permissible in cases of adultery. Nowhere in Scripture do we see a mandate for divorce. But we do see in Matthew 5, through Jesus' words, that divorce is permissible in cases of adultery. And Paul adds here, if a spouse is a Christ follower and is abandoned by a spouse who isn't, they are free to pursue a divorce. Again, it's not mandatory. It's not something that has to be done, but it is a viable option for them within God's design for marriage. And we would say that within these these situations, that if there are biblical grounds that either Jesus talked about in Matthew 5 or what Paul talks about here in 1 Corinthians 7 for a marriage to end, then absolutely you're free to remarry. But if not, then we would go back to the cautions that we read in verses 11 and 12. And say, if you're divorced outside of those, it's best for you, it is best for you to remain single. To remain single. 
This idea of making a spouse holy doesn't mean that they're a Christian. I, I know you might read some of those words and, and be a little confused. They're, they're somewhat difficult to process and to understand. But this idea of making a spouse holy doesn't mean that they're a Christian by default because you're a Christian. Everybody has to make their own personal decision whether or not they follow Jesus. You can't bring other people into heaven because you've said, well, you live with me, so you're, you're following Jesus. And some of you, that's a really frustrating thing in your life because you wish you could. You love somebody so much, whether it's a spouse or a kid, you love them so incredibly much, you would do anything, you would do anything for them to to be a Christ follower and to make the decision to follow Jesus. But the reality is we can't force it upon anybody else and we can't make that decision for anybody else. So this idea of making a spouse holy doesn't mean that they're magically a Christian by default because you're a Christ follower. But what it does mean is this concept that they are a recipient of God's blessing as a result of being in close proximity with somebody who follows Jesus. And just think about it. As we've talked about frequently, what are the impacts of us making the decision to follow Jesus? Well, the impacts of our life that, that is lived, that is full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And as we look out at our society, we see that all of these things are in such short supply. So just as a default of living with somebody whose life embodies these principles, there is a blessing that comes about as a result. You can't make somebody else's decision for them. You can't make somebody else follow Jesus. And that's why if you're here and you're single, it is so vital. It is so vital that you make sure that you're on the same page with them spiritually. Or I promise you this, you will face numerous issues with them later on. You will. And I know that, I know that you're so in love and they're just perfect and the way that they look at you and their smile, it, it just it makes your heart skip a beat every single time. That will fade. That'll fade. You'll see them after they work out, or you'll see them on the day they feel sick, and you'll be like, oh, okay. And that's, that's ingrained. You'll see them when they're working on a project around the house. You'll see that you should have bought them two belts for Christmas. I mean, you're going to see things, I promise. You're going to see things in a relationship where all of a sudden that, the, that little flutter disappears. It just goes away. You have to work at it. And I know right now that you have that flutter and you think, well, they check off every other box. They make me laugh. I have more confidence when I'm around them. They are fine with a capital fine. And this is just the only thing, the only thing that doesn't work is that we're just not on the same page spiritually. And I promise you this, this will bring about more problems in your life than any of those other things in your relationship. Do not settle. If you are single, remember, it is always better to be single wishing you were married than married wishing you were single. And there are people in this room who, if they could right now, would stand up and scream. That is so true. Because there are people in every room you enter who feel stuck in a horrible relationship. And they wouldn't say this, but honestly, if they had the chance to go back and do it all again, they would. And they would choose differently. And we don't want that for any of you. And so if you feel that way, we want to help you work your way to a better marriage. But understand, it takes work. It doesn't happen naturally. Falling in love happens naturally. It's like gravity. It just happens. Staying in love is really difficult. And it takes a lot of hard work. And so if you find yourself in a marriage that's loveless and, and you're struggling, we want to help you work your way to a better marriage. But if you find yourself right now and you're not married and you're with somebody, but you don't align spiritually, then it's going to hurt. 
and it's going to hurt a lot. But you need to end that now. Because if you don't, it's going to hurt a lot more later on. I promise you that. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. The grass isn't greener on the other side. The grass isn't greener on the other side. And there are days when marriage is easy and it's awesome, and there are days where it's incredibly difficult. And frankly, it's a disaster. And the temptation on those days is to look out at everybody else. To look at social media, to see the pictures of their vacation, see the pictures of their date, to see how they've served their spouse, to see what they've done for them, how everything's better for them. The grass isn't greener on the other side. It isn't. And you may think, well, everything's perfect and easy for them. I assure you it isn't. It's not. Embrace where you are in life. If it's single, you're going to have times that are challenging. But embrace it. Being married does not complete you. If you are married, embrace it. Being single, again, will not complete you. The grass isn't greener on the other side. Which means some of you need to quit messaging your ex on Facebook or Instagram, sending them DMs on Twitter or texting them. You need to delete some numbers and maybe you need to delete some friends or frankly, just some social media accounts altogether. The grass isn't greener on the other side. You broke up with that person for a reason, and you're with somebody else now for a reason, and you don't need to start thinking, well, if we go back there, everything's going to be great, and everything's going to be easy, and we can rekindle the old flame. The old flame was extinguished for a reason. Keep it out. Embrace where you find yourself. We shoot down to verse 32, and there's a lot of great other content that's in this chapter, so we'd encourage you this week to to read it. But we shoot down to verse 32 where we read these words. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord, but the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided, and the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about the worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Again, if you choose to get married, and that is a very viable option, it's an option that the vast majority of those of us here today have made. If you choose to get married, that is a very viable option. God isn't angry at you. God isn't mad at you. God understands. And he wants your marriage to be incredible. But he just tells you straight up, you're choosing to have problems. You're choosing to have problems. Don't point at your spouse right now, all right? But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the minute you choose to get married, you're choosing problems. Now, if you're engaged, you know, I understand. You're like, well, thanks, Brett. This is wonderful. As I'm planning every aspect of my wedding, this is great to hear. But it's true. You're choosing problems. And then you might love your problems, but you're choosing problems. Brooke loves her problems, but you don't think that woman has had a lot more problems in her, in her life since she said I do to me? <laughs> like, her life's become incredibly more difficult. She chose problems. So did I. <laughs> I chose problems. So if you're married, so did you. You chose problems. And they can be wonderful, fantastic, phenomenal problems. But there's going to be times you just want to hang up the phone and roll your eyes and shout at the heavens because you're choosing problems. Marriage can be and should be a wonderful, wonderful thing. But understand, it's incredibly difficult. It's incredibly difficult. Because every day you're faced with the choice, am I going to be selfish or am I going to be selfless? 
And when you're single, you don't have to make that choice. But when you're married, every single day you're faced with that choice. Every day. We go down to verse 39 and 40 to close the chapter where we read these words. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. Yet in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God. So he says, listen, marriage is permanent. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. If he dies, she's free to be married again if she wants to be. But notice what he says, only in the Lord. But make sure that if you choose to become married again, that that person is united with you in terms of your faith viewpoint. Make sure that they're united in terms of your faith viewpoint. This isn't a secondary thing. This isn't an optional thing. He says, make sure on all the things that you could be united on, you are united in terms of where you stand spiritually. Marriage is permanent. So let's make sure as people who follow Jesus, we treat it as such. That marriage is permanent and we treat it as such. That we have a high value placed on marriage. And that we understand that it is not easy and it takes work. And so we want to be here to encourage you and support you. To cheer you on and to help you any way we can. But again, if you're married, you already understand this. It takes work. And there are going to be seasons in your marriage that are phenomenal. And then a week to two, the honeymoon's over. And then it's like, well, now what? Because real life hits. And you can find those phenomenal seasons again. But there are going to be seasons where it's incredibly difficult. Where life is just coming at you. Where there's uncertainty and there's stress and there's kids and there's challenges and there's obligations and it's hard. So what does all this mean? Well, first, if you're single, follow God's plan for sex. Follow God's plan for sex. Sex is an incredible thing that God has designed and God has gifted to us, but it needs to be contained. We saw last week that nothing will ruin your life more than walking outside of these confines that God places. Because sex is so powerful and because it's so wonderful, he's given us this gift, but he says, here are the parameters that it needs to be enjoyed in. And those parameters are that it's personal, it's between you and your spouse, that it's private, and that it's permanent. Second, if you're single, be incredibly picky. Don't apologize. Be incredibly picky. It's better to be single wishing you were married than married wishing you were single. If if you're single, be incredibly picky about who you'll date. And even more so about who you'll marry. Don't settle. Don't settle. Be incredibly picky. It's fine. And it doesn't matter what your mom thinks or what your grandma thinks or what her mom thinks. None of that matters. You be incredibly picky, and you don't apologize for it. Now, understand, you're not going to find somebody who's perfect, because if if you did, they wouldn't put up with you. But you're not going to find somebody. You're not going to find somebody who's perfect. But you need to find the perfect person for you. So be incredibly picky. If you're married, follow God's plan for sex within your marriage. Early and often. Follow God's plan for sex in your marriage. That it is a hallmark. It is a place where you find your security being together, being intimate with one another. And celebrate each other. Celebrate each other. There's a lot of things that will knock you down in life. You don't need your spouse to be one of them. Celebrate each other and be willing to put in the hard work. And if you're single again, don't rush into another relationship that will leave you with regret. 
don't rush into another relationship. Don't feel like you have to run into something. Be okay being alone. There's nothing wrong with you. You're not missing something. What we've seen here is he says, listen, it's an easier life. Don't rush into another relationship. And lastly, know that you don't have to walk through heartache alone. If you've experienced the the death of a spouse, if you've experienced a divorce, we're here for you. We want to encourage you. We want to walk with you. We know that these things can be heart-wrenching. They can just... They can tear you apart, and it can make you feel less than whole. And our message to you is you are not alone, and you do not have to walk through these events alone. And frankly, oftentimes, these things impact us at a deeper level than what we even imagine or can fathom when they, when they happen. And so if you've dealt with the death of a spouse or if you've gone through a divorce, There is no shame in asking somebody to walk with you. And as a family and as a community, it would be our privilege to do so. This is God's design for sex and relationships. And while it's countercultural, we've seen what has happened when the fires of sex and relationships have not been constrained. And we've seen the destruction culturally and individually in many of us when we step outside of God's design. And so each of us has a choice. And that choice is whether or not we'll Commit to following Jesus with every area of our lives, including our sexuality and our relationships. That these are good things, but they must be contained. God, I pray that we would be people who honor you with our sexuality. I pray that our relationships would be life-giving, encouraging. I pray that we would be marked as people who are willing to fight for our marriages, understanding it's not easy. I pray for people who are here and find themselves single. And I pray, God, that they wouldn't believe the lie that they're not enough or that there's something wrong with them, that they have to be with somebody else. But God, if that's their desire, then I pray that they would take the time to find the right person, to be incredibly picky, and to say, we're going to choose to do things God's way, not ours. I pray, God, that this idea of sex would be a theme of security for the marriages within Lakeside, and not something that separates us. I pray that we would be people who put in the hard work. And I pray for those who are here and have gone through the heartache of divorce or death of a spouse. And I pray, God, that you would heal their hearts. I pray that you would allow them to process what has happened that in their brokenness, in their heartache, they would seek you. God, may we honor you in every area of our life. In your son, Jesus' name we pray.